Just go and record. Well, sir, your name is? Howard A. Sykes. Once upon a time, you were born in? Beg your pardon? Where were you born, sir? I was born in Nebraska. <laughs> I was a farmer in Nebraska. <laughs> born on the farm. Mm -hmm. My folks were farmers. How much acreage? They didn't have very much. A couple of hundred acres about is all they had at that time. A pair of mules and a plow? We used steam engines to to thrash with and used the old horses to take care of the plowing and all of that. Mm -hmm. We didn't have it was finally we got forts and tractors. Dad used to do the plowing and and some of the harvesting. So he had moved up to tractors in the early 30s? Yes. Um, yeah, there were forts and tractors that we used. But, but originally when we did anything <coughs> like harvesting wheat, we used a uh, steam engine and had to fire that up to make, and the, we kept, we shoveled the grain from the thrasher to the, to the um, granary that we had there on the farm. Ooh. You so had to stack all of the, all of the grain, the bundles from the harvest, and they went into the machine, and that's the harvest. Did you, uh, <clears throat> the machine didn't go through the field, it was just at the field? That's right. So you brought the grain? We did the binding of, yeah. the, of the wheat. That was by horses. How'd you cut it? They cut it with that. With the horses. Uh huh. So you had a sickle mower or a. Or a... I guess that was, that's what that was at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we would in farming. Why they would butcher a hog and a, a beef usually, and. Uh, that part was all done by multiple people around the farm there. Usually about November? Yes. We would do that at that time. They'd do everything from make sausage to lard to whatever, and uh, the meat was canned. So we could keep it over the year, uh, yeah. the rest of the year. Later, after I left the farm, we moved temporarily to DeWitt, Nebraska. My dad was a, he, he had bought a service station there, and so he sold petroleum products out of the, out of the service station. And later, about, uh, before we moved, we moved from DeWitt, Nebraska to Hallam, Nebraska, and Dad had purchased a, a company there. So we had a tank wagon service for the farm trade and a, and a service station. We used hand pumps to pump the product off of the railroad to the, to the tanks. A hand pump? Hand pumps. There's a lot of people who won't catch the significance we of never, that. We never had uh, electric pumps or anything like that. And that went all through the years. But uh, we finally built a service station there in, in Hallam. And we operated out of that and did our farm trade by taking a our tank wagons out into the 
to the area where the the uh, farmers were. They they'd call in and we'd have to deliver it with a tank wagon. Was that on uh, solid rubber tires or? What's that? Was that on solid rubber tires on the tank wagon? No, not solid tires. They were air. They were regular tires. Chain driven or? What? Was it chain driven? No. Okay. Not those. Those pretty late models. Can that no, time? There was later in there. That would have been. Huh, I have to go back and <laughs> figure out when that was. See, I. I graduated from high school in 1937. So about 10 years, see, I, I skipped a grade, so that's why I was in, but I didn't go to school until I was seven years old. <laughs> <laughs> so then I had to skip a couple grades before I got out and then I, I graduated from Hallam High School and stayed out of out of school for about a year. While well, my dad uh, he built a service station in 1937, so I didn't go to the college until 1938, and uh, I was there. I spent four years in the university and with the ROTC. Oh. Uh, so you were exposed to military training in college? Yes. I, I did all four years of, of uh, ROTC and graduated then in 1942. Did you get commissioned immediately or did you have to go through some training so school? You were commissioned right after ROTC. As a reserve officer? I was a reserve officer at that, but actually I went right into the Army, the service, right after I got out of college. You bet you did. <laughs> yeah, I was, they were ready for me. <laughs> Come so, on. <laughs> so when I, when I got out of, out of college, why I immediately was sent to, to um, Fort Knox, Kentucky. Armor school. I was in the armored school or armored to everything over there was armored. Uh huh. Army. Using the uh oh. we had the old we had tanks and all kinds of equipment at Fort Knox. You had thirty seven millimeter forward firing cannon on the We had all kinds of weapons and and uh uh the tanks, I don't remember exactly what they called them, but they were the old style, you know. And, uh, Did you study Hitler's uh, tactics? Not much. Uh, not much. But uh, if you want me to go on, I can tell you, you know, what I did then. I, I go on from there. When I arrived at Fort Knox, they uh, sent me to officer's training, which was like your, uh, it was our, like ROTC. And we spent about six weeks in officer's training. And then we were assigned uh, to one of the divisions but the sequence in there is, is quite different. But I, I go from the, after I go out of the uh, old, uh, officer's training, OTC, I'm assigned to a maintenance unit and it was armored equipment. I was Actually, I, they pushed me over to be in the maintenance part because I had maintenance training while I was in doing service work for my folks. 
you know, when I'd run the service station and run tank wagons and stuff like that be before. And then, so I actually graduated, as I said, in June of 1942. And at that time, I was in the Army as a lieutenant. And uh, from that point on, I had various duties. I was assigned to a maintenance group, but we went on desert maneuvers in the Mojave <laughs> Desert <laughs> for about two months. And uh, we had motorcycles and half tracks. Half tracks uh, were kind of pushed out later because they didn't serve all the needs of the, of the service. Uh, we used the motorcycles over there and we carried them a lot more than we, we rode them. <laughs> <laughs> you had to, they were pretty difficult to run through the, the desert. And after that, my, uh, we came back <clears throat> I came back to Fort Knox after that training there uh, in the Mojave Desert and uh, I was assigned to a, a, a special job. I trained, uh, tested motorcycles. I had 20 motorcycles and a crew to go along with them. We had 10 Indians and and 10 Harley Davidsons and we'd run those 24 hours a day. We ran highway, cross country and uh, the uh, were secondary roads the three things, secondary highway, secondary roads, and cross country. And uh, we'd go through some of the tank ranges out there where the tanks would make big piles of dirt <laughs> when they turned, you know. Oh, yeah. And uh, I can remember, but uh, then right shortly after all of that, I was assigned to the motorcycle department and I trained GIs on motorcycles. How to ride the motorcycle, how to use them in a deployment? You had motorcycles uh, to train with and uh, we actually did the full nine yards of, of, of work on any motorcycle that we had. Maintenance included in the training? Maintenance and training, and we tore them completely apart. Chain-driven Harleys? No. Just, just a regular Harley, two-cylinder. Two yeah. Uh -huh. And, uh, but out of the deal, when we made that test, we decided that the Harley-Davidson had the best motor, and the Indian had the best uh, carriage <laughs> and if you could put the two together you had a softer ride and a and a good motor you know <laughs> but but after that and then I when I got assigned to the motorcycle department in in Fort Knox the unusual thing there was that John Harley was a lieutenant as I was uh, and he was a part of the Harley Davidson motorcycle. So we trained together. Uh, we had GIs were sent in to us to do, to train, and then we'd send them out to the various maintenance organizations. What did the Army envision the uh, motorcycle to be used for? What's that? Would the, would the Army envision the motorcycle to be used? Well, they thought they could use them for 
uh, convoy work. They were going to use them on convoys. And uh, actually what happened then, after we, well, we worked on the motorcycles and trained with them for about, oh, it was a little better over, the, uh, better than a year. Uh, before we were given other assignments. And uh, the, uh, they did MPs use the motorcycle too, if they could, you know, where, wherever they could. But that finally they disbanded the motorcycle department and everything went into the wheeled vehicles. That was tanks and trucks and jeeps and what have you. After we got through with that, then uh, our last assignment was assignment to go overseas. And uh, we went in the Pacific in the, and uh, we went as a, uh, as a, a battalion, armored battalion. And we were sent overseas in the Pacific, and we landed in, uh, well, there, there's one place they called Hollandia, and the other was New Guinea itself, you know. <laughs> and we lived under the palm trees for the time, but when we went overseas, we had the regular cruise ships, and the personnel, we ate from menus and everything. <laughs> That was really nice. <laughs> it wasn't Army Chow, huh? Yeah, it was a good Army <laughs> Chow. But, but uh, they really served us well going overseas. And so we landed there in New Guinea. And uh, I have to retrace a little bit because the battalion, the armored battalion that I went overseas with was broken up and one company out of the battalion was disbanded and they went into the other companies of the battalion. You went from four square to three square, three. What's that? You went from four yeah. army configuration to, yeah. to tri-cap or to yeah. three, one, two, three, yeah. uh, but three the, companies, three whatever. Yeah, they, they disbanded one company because, and then the personnel just went into the other companies that were left. Well, I was supposed to be the battalion maintenance officer when I went overseas, but I didn't get that job. I had a time off uh, before I was scheduled to really go overseas, and the battalion commander had to get somebody to be the battalion maintenance officer. <laughs> so. so I didn't get that job and and when we got overseas and we got rid of the one company, the battalion commander says, well, I'm going to get you with the army, the 5th Army over there. And they were already on New Guinea and they, he said that I'll assign you to let you go if you want to the ordinance. So I went down to the, because I'd had all that mechanical training. So I went from there, I went down to the Army and, uh, or, uh, and <laughs> the next day I was an ordnance officer. <laughs> <laughs> so I started my work there. I was a lieutenant, a first lieutenant for that time. And uh, I worked up for parts and all that kind of stuff for the, the units that were over there. They were primarily the, uh, the ducks. <laughs> they used those for lighterage, you know, from the ship to the shore. Yeah. And we had a, had a lot of maintenance on those because of the coral it would hit that 
the boots that were over the wheel and destroy them, and then they had to had to take the wheel off and uh, clean out everything and regrease it again. You know. Well, that to the common man, they don't know what a duck is. That's right. But it's a regular. It was a GM, GM General Motors truck, really, and uh, it's a vehicle that would go in the water and on the land. So you could assault the shore without having to build a dock to get everybody off. We, we deliver equipment and supplies. They would bring in the ships, the landing ship tanks, or la landing ships is really what they were. And they'd moor out there as close as they could get in, you know, and they would bring supplies into the, to the base there. That's important. What? That's important. The supply part is only, yeah. you know, without they bullets, part without of the gas, supply train. without food. We had, uh, I had at one time there with the uh, Army Ordnance, uh, I had 20 duck companies. 20 duck 20. companies. 20 companies. How was that organized? Well, a company. <laughs> if they just did lighterage work, mostly. I mean, uh, but a company has how many ducks in it? I don't remember how many we had, but... Uh, That's just a, a bunch. What? That's a lot of ducks. Yeah. I don't remember the number, but there was a lot. And I would go from the Army headquarters to the various areas where these duck companies were situated, you know, after we landed there on New Guinea. And uh, I'd, I'd work with the company commanders to see how their training was going with, the, with that particular vehicle, the, the ducks, and also try to supply parts for them from the, from the states. When, <clears throat> to the common man, when you're talking about supplying parts, they came across in a ship of some sort and you unloaded them at the destination, but you had to have an unloading point. Yeah. Well, you had to go build that. Well, they had, they had, a, had places, but mostly they, they just moor out there, not too far away from the shore. And you'd go get it. And we'd bring that, the, these ducks in there and, uh, They'd take the supplies off of the ship and put them on the duck and send them to the shore. And when the duck got to the shore, you trucked it to some location that you had just recently built. Yeah. Wasn't there before, six months before. No. Didn't have shelves in it. Yeah. I mean, just the small details. First of all, you had to get the supplies, but a shelf to put them on. Yeah. And a roof over their head because it rains all the time out there. We had... Protection of tents. your goods. <laughs> tents. We lived in tents out there. We didn't have any good area to, to harbor. And we wide open spaces out there. You just lived under the palm trees. You so, and the mosquitoes? And I guess there were plenty of mosquitoes out there. Uh -huh. too. I mean, just sanitary facilities. Yeah. You went to that little building way yeah, out there? Yeah, they, they had the... Little buildings out there uh -huh. for that. But, uh, Wonderful aroma around the little buildings in the summertime, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, they did, they did well with those, uh, uh, those LSTs. They dropped those supplies off of there and, and, uh, they were just called landing ships, you know, at that time. But uh, most of it was amphibious, the whole thing. Yeah. Now, where the tanks went to, I don't know. Except when we got to the Philippines, why, we saw the results. <laughs> what? They had those tanks, and they were personnel carriers. And... They could go through those rice paddies, and if we needed, if they needed personnel, they just 
let them out that the back of the of the tank was dropped down and they could people would come out and that's where they caught most of the Japs. The Japs were over all over those areas and mm -hmm. rice paddies and so forth. Mechanized infantry. Yeah. That's what the concept became. Yeah. But uh, it, it those vehicles really were good. They they were track track vehicles and uh, they would go on land and in the in the water, the amphibious part. Because we trained, before we went overseas, we were in the Monterey Bay, and we trained with those vehicles. At Fort Ord? Yeah, Fort Ord. I have a little training at Fort Ord. Yeah. Fort Ord. And uh, we lived a short distance from there. They called that the salad bowl of the nation. Sure is. <laughs> And you wonder why, because they had all kinds of vegetables and everything right there. It was in, they grew them all. But after we, after we got overseas and later then, they decided that they wanted those tanks. I said they, the uh, personnel uh, of the army took those amphibians and went across the, the Philippines. I think it was on the southern part that they started. And they'd drop them off in the water and they'd go all the way in on shore. And uh, that's, like I said before, the, that's how they got most of those Japanese out of the Philippines. Yeah, the Japanese had been at war for years before they decided to pick on the United States of America. That's right. They had they had all kinds of equipment over there, you know. And uh, but <clears throat> we moved actually from New Guinea to the Philippines with the army, and uh, I can tell you one incident there. It wasn't too long after we arrived with the with the army on the Philippines that one day we heard a plane come in and it was an old DC-3 with a big Japanese sign on the side of it and it barely landed on the <laughs> on the on the uh, area there that we had and then those Japanese scattered out and they were part of a, of a, of a team, you know, to destroy the army, you know, oh. that we had over there. And uh, fortunately, we were able to get enough of the MPs and they got all of them. Well, shortly after they got out of that airplane. And uh, then later, I was sent to what they called San Fernando North. That's uh, north of, uh, north of Man uh, Manila. And at that time, Manila was pretty well destroyed. Yes, it was. They had everything. But wasn't long after I arrived over there, I, I was made a, a company commander of a heavy automotive maintenance company. And uh, we set up on the, on the beach area but they still had some of those cannons they could lob over on the beach, you know, big caliber stuff, you know. Fortunately, we didn't have any problems with it, but they they had these shacks built over the top of these, these mortars, and they'd run them off, shoot, 
run them back on so we couldn't see where they came from. <laughs> mm. The camouflage. Yes. Camouflage stuff like that. Is a real mount gun? Was it a real mount gun? I, I don't know whether that was or not, but they were mounted in that uh, little hut. That, that That's where they, they'd shoot the, uh, the uh, cannon. It was a kind of a cannon that I, I remember. Yeah, it was something big enough to shoot out there. Oh, yeah. They were a pretty good size. Well, they, uh, in the artillery, they already knew it's called reference point, yeah. and it RP'd everything out there on the shore. Yeah. So all they had to do was put the reference point in their FDC, and then, okay, yeah. click, and it would hit close by. Yeah, but that was something kind of interesting. They they didn't know those were, they were out there for a while, you know. They had to make sure that they'd get them all, you know. At least. Because they'd just lob them over on the beach and, you know, hope to hit a, a supply point. When I got over on the, on the, in the north uh, area with the, for San Fernando North, uh, this, this heavy automotive maintenance company, we did everything. I mean, in maintenance. They could, uh, like when we got into these ducks we had trouble with those hubs and we had to redo those things all the time because they, the boot would lose they get destroyed by the coral and uh, they were always replacing the boots and we couldn't get enough of them to replace them so we decided one day that, that we would go and drill the hub of these vehicles and take the grease out and use transmission fluid to for the uh, the hubs and that worked pretty good for a while we didn't have to have to take that grease out as often we were able to take and use uh, transmission fluid. Sounds we, like the uh, the grease attracted the sand from the beach and the coral also and ground it up into fine pieces and then ruined the bearings. Yeah. Well the transmission oil was more was uh, didn't make it hang on there so much and it settled yeah. out in the... See uh, the, it was a project that the army didn't really recognize. They didn't want you to drill those yeah. hubs. Field expediency. And we did it anyhow. We <laughs> went and did that. And it helped a lot. I mean, as far as getting the lighter edge going, we didn't have as big a deadline uh, as a result of, of being able to change that transmission grease in the, in, the, in the hubs. So. Who came up with that formula? Well, I don't know exactly, but the, our group there, we had some pretty experienced mechanics mm -hmm. that we, I remember we, uh, we made an ice cream machine over there. <laughs> but they, <laughs> they found parts and so forth and put it all together <laughs> and had ice and ice cream and so forth. We, we'd find out that they, they had ships coming in to uh, the Philippines there, and uh, these supply sergeants would say, well, Captain, tonight I'm going to send a truck out. <laughs> Boy, the next day we had eggs and, and <laughs> everything for, for food. <laughs> you have whole eggs or dried eggs? What? You have whole eggs or dried eggs? We had a whole eggs there for a while. Ooh. Fresh stuff came in. Uh -huh. Because... But we would only we we'd find out when that when that ship was going to come in. But we would what we would do in the meantime, we'd take these old jeeps that were to be repaired, and we would take them down to the navy, 
and they'd lift them on, on the boat and they'd use them for transportation when they, they could, right on the, in the area there. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> so it was a trade-off for the fresh stuff from, yeah. the, from the ships would go to our company and uh, then <clears throat> when, the, when the war was over. Where were you? We were at San Fernando North <laughs> and I, I had, uh, I was getting ready to take two shiploads of equipment to Japan. You were getting ready to invade Japan. Yeah, well, we were ready to, you know, support them. We would yeah. come in about 10 days after, after the fighting was over with. When you say the war was over, was that a general announcement? Did you know what happened? Well, it took a long time for them to get it all squared around. Under the, the rumor was that we had, uh, as we common phrase is, nuked Japan. Yeah. You didn't know what a nuke was. Yeah, we didn't know much about that. But anyhow, they uh, <clears throat> they sent us into Japan. I had two ships loaded with uh, maintenance equipment for the heavy automotive maintenance company. Ready to go to work. And we took off, and boy, it was rough out there. And that, I don't know, is that the China Sea? That's right there near the Japan. I think so. I think that's what, but anyhow, there was a storm went through there and we had vehicles tied down on the deck, you know, you know and that was so rough out there, they just break that mooring and go off and fly off the side of the ship. So it wasn't a very comfortable trip, but we ended up in Japan, in Nagoya. After? After we'd been in, but you landed in Japan after we'd nuked him, and they, the uh, Emperor Hirohito, called an end of the war. Yeah, yeah. It was the end of the war. Uh huh. Right? And uh, they, we went into Nagoya, and it was about a forty-mile trip to get to shore. From where we were, there was an inlet in there to, that was navigable at that time. And we had our ships, like I said, that were loaded with maintenance equipment. We were ready to set up a maintenance area in Japan. And uh, we, when we went to Nagoya, we went down through that channel, which was about 40 miles long, and they were exploding the, a lot of the uh, the floating bombs that were out in the in the area going to Nagoya, and they it, kind of a shaky time. The Japanese had mined everything. Had mines. Yep. And those mines were flo were floating around out there in the in the bay, you know. But fortunately, we had some equipment ahead, some ships ahead, could spot the things and detonate them. Well, when we got on shore, we had landed at the Aichi Aircraft Factory. <laughs> oh. and we took advantage of all of the, uh, they had a, had a, a equipment, uh, but, <clears throat> but with the bombing, they broke all of the underground things that, of that factory. The factory was underground, you know, and uh, the uh, area had about, oh, two, three feet of water in it. And we were able to get some of the equipment there to put on shore and use. Uh, but we went ahead and we set up company, uh, set up the company, and uh, 
worked on the vehicles that we that got had trouble with you, maintenance. Or what something. were they using the vehicles for? They were jeeps. I mean, what? They were just patrolling the area? Right there, they, yes. You didn't have a big welcome mat on the shore when you <laughs> walk, drove in? No, I don't think so. What were the Japanese people treating you like? Just well, conquerors? We didn't get much contact with, with the Japanese at that time. They were all gone, apparently. They'd evacuated or just? I think either evacuated because we got on shore, we didn't have any trouble. So we'd bombed their factory flat, huh? Well, when they bombed it, they cracked all of the underground stuff. That's why the water was in there. They, it was un, not usable anymore. So the Japanese had buried their factory to keep yeah. it from our bombers. That's right. That was post-1941? <laughs> yeah, someplace in there. Uh, that was later, though. We were over there about 1943. Did, uh, <clears throat> just digressing a little bit, uh, you were in high school in 1941, or you'd, where were you in December the 7th, 1941? Yeah. December 7th, 41. I was in, in college at that time. Uh-huh. So there was I a lot graduated of, in, in 42. Yeah. So there was a lot of talk on campus about what we're going to do. Yeah. That was uh, we probably... We didn't have much information at all, you know, about our our next step or anything. They, it was kind of quiet. But uh, You knew something was going to occur. We knew something was going to happen. Uh-huh. And uh, but we... Managed all right in a lot of areas, but the good part by uh, I had a a mess sergeant in the company over there in in uh, in the Philippines. And he was a huckster in New York, and boy, he was a good one. I mean, he <laughs> he'd take you. We, he said, Captain, I'm going to take a trip tonight get a few supplies. <laughs> so that's when they went out and got contact mm -hmm. with the Navy and they exchanged a Jeep for the supplies. <laughs> so in, in the books you have to survey the Jeep means you write it off. Beg your pardon? You had to survey the Jeep means that you well you followed the legal channel so that the Jeep went the away. The Jeep w was was really not usable anymore. Yeah. And they, we just took various parts off, and so we had no recognition of the vehicle itself. Mm -hmm. That's how we could get rid of them at the Navy. And when they got, if they needed to, they just take them and dump them over side, over the side, if they didn't use them. You know? Yeah. And they couldn't keep them on board because somebody would come in. And, tell them that you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Navy, not the Army. What are you yeah. doing with a Jeep on the deck? <laughs> they, want to, they like that Navy, I'll tell you. But <laughs> you eat, uh, on a normal ration, did you eat normal foods or did you eat rat? For a while, uh, we would. And we had rations, too. But this is stuff that was prepared in the United States for shipment, you know, canned meat, like you were canning meat Some of that when you were a yeah. kid or a well, young... We had pretty... We had pretty good food because we, this mess sergeant we had, boy, he'd take care of us. We had good, good people. But, uh, but that's about as far as, as I went. I mean, we'd skipped, like I said, when we landed in New Guinea went to the Philippines and came around with some of the equipment and I put that company on, uh, on in San Fernando North. Yeah. MacArthur said, I shall return. Yeah. And you had returned by that time. <laughs> we went into Manila a couple times uh, 
from San Fernando, and uh, of course the Manila Hotel was a wreck. They had bombed the darn thing, and it wasn't long thereafter that enough equipment came, and the hotel was back in operation. Ooh. Yep. American Aid, huh? <laughs> they, brought, they brought everything, you know. You had uh, somehow captured all the Japanese that were active in the Philippines by that time? Pretty much. Yeah, except for that one there, guy they found in 1970. There was one occasion when up there in the uh, northern part, the, uh, there was a cavalry outfit that was up there fighting the Japs early. And <clears throat> they'd take these amphibians and go up the river and they'd take supplies in and they'd bring wounded out. Uh, they, they did that on a lot of occasions. But uh, they used uh, the uh, the tanks to do that, not the not the ducks that we talked about earlier. And uh, but there was a lot of fighting that went on in the in that one part up there. Yeah, the the uh, Japanese didn't have the same tank te technology as the Germans did. Mm -hmm. uh, we were able to extinguish their uh, capability pretty quickly, uh, according to most reports. Uh huh. But we, we didn't have much time in between all of this. We moved along pretty quickly. That's right. Get everything cleaned up. And, uh, you were always on the move, and yeah. as soon as you settled down, it's time to get ready to move but again. I wasn't with the, the, the combat you know, because I got displaced overseas. <laughs> and... That's when they sent me to the Army uh, Ordnance Section. Mm -hmm. so. Well, the Army is about food and bullets. Got to have both of them. Otherwise, you're not an Army. That's right. Absolutely. One way or the other. But the Army was the one that would, did all the fighting, you know. they go up in there and clean out an area. But... Uh, we were always behind. We were support, you know, for all of the other, you know, for the equipment and the food and all, everything. So the Japanese had evacuated the city that you went into with the factory? <laughs> they just left, huh? Uh, well, they had to. They, were, they had bombed that sucker a lot. There was, because <clears throat> all the underground stuff was not usable anymore. They, like I said, there was about th that much water that was in every one of those underground places that they had there for that Aichi aircraft factory. E Can you spell that in English? Aichi? Yeah. Uh, it was... A I C H E I. Okay. Aichi Aircraft Factory. But uh, we. Well, had you had the end of the war. Somehow you made it back to the United States. Yeah. Were y'all pretty excited about hearing about the end of the war officially? Well, we we heard about it, and but we, there wasn't much you could do about it. You just had to wait your turn uh -huh. to return to the states, and uh, we ended up in Seattle, Washington, on the after the war was over, and. Well, you have to imagine, we pulled out all of our military, or uh -huh. except for the people that sit there to watch Japan. Yeah. What did the, do you have any remembrance of what the locals did? Did they come back to Aichi? No. We were so busy taking care of our own equipment and trying to get 
established there on the shore uh, after arriving from Nagoya. And uh, we didn't have hardly any contact with the natives. So you're in the maintenance part, you had more difficulty because this, the sand and the uh, seawater combination, yeah. both of which were caustic like anything to metal. Yeah. Sand grinds the metal down, seawater rusts it. But, uh, yeah, that, that was hard on those ducks, I'll tell you. <laughs> but, as I said, we drilled out hubs two holes, one on one side, one on the other, and we'd flush them out and then put in that transmission fluid. Mm -hmm. and, uh, All the grease did was hold the sand into it so it helped it grind it even more. Well, And now the oil allowed the, yeah. the uh, sand to settle out slightly. But there was, once those boots broke on those ducks, why well, it let that seawater in and and uh, sand and what have you, and they need to be repaired right away. So in maintenance, <clears throat> the, the duck was kind of heavy maintenance? It was. We were a ham company, as they called it, an HAM, heavy automotive maintenance, and we could do anything. <laughs> One way or the other, huh? Well, they were able to, they'd take a, a Jeep that had been hurt some way or another, and uh, they'd put a, all the equipment back in there that needed to be. So every, every one of the vehicles were put back on the, on the usable line again afterwards. Did y'all load up the vehicles on the way out of Japan? Or did you leave them there? We left them there. Everything was just left. I don't know whatever happened. Gift from the United States of America. Uh, if you can read English, you'll learn how to operate this right. thing. <laughs> well, it was a wonder. How did they get that DC-3 to fly and then come in on that beach when we were there at the Army headquarters? You know. Where, where did they get the DC-3? Well, that's the, one of the best airplanes ever built. Uh, oh, yeah. Still have DC-3s flying yeah. today. Everything. That was a good good plane, good airplane. It was used for a lot of things. This good tractor. Mm -hmm. Truck it through the air. Tractor it through the air. Yeah. But they... Hey, let's uh let's pause for a minute.